everyone's doing well and that you've had a wonderful day. We're going to start chapter seven today of The Secret Garden. Chapter six was quite a gripping one. Mary had woken up to find it a very soggy grey day and unable to go out and explore. She'd taken it upon herself to explore Misselthwaite Manor. So she'd gone in scores of rooms. She'd explored different corridors, different floors. She found some tiny mice living inside a cushion. She found some toy elephants that she had a little play with. Uh, but she also discovered um, a secret passage hidden behind a tapestry. And she heard again that mysterious cry. She also got in a bit of trouble with Mrs. Medlock for being nosy and got sent back to her room in quite a bit of trouble. So we're gonna pick up today and see what's happening at Misselthwaite Manor. Chapter seven is called The Key of the Garden. Two days after this, when Mary opened her eyes, she sat upright in bed immediately and called to Martha. Look at the moor, look at the moor. The rainstorm had ended and the grey mist and clouds had been swept away in the night by the wind. The wind itself had ceased and a brilliant deep blue sky arched high over the moorland. Never, never had Mary dreamed of a sky so blue. In India, skies were hot and blazing. This was of a deep, cool blue, which almost seemed to sparkle like the waters of some lovely bottomless lake. And here and there, high, high in the arched blueness, floated small clouds of snow-white fleece. The far-reaching world of the moor itself looked softly blue instead of gloomy purple-black or awful dreary grey. Aye, said Martha with a cheerful grin. Storm's over for a bit. It does look like this at this time of year. It goes off in a night like it were pretending it had never been here and never meant to come again. That's because springtime's on its way. It's a long way off yet, but it's coming. I thought perhaps it always rained or looked dark in England, Mary said. Eh, hey, no, said Martha sitting up on her heels among her black lead brushes. Now to saw it. What does that mean? asked Mary seriously. In India, the natives spoke different dialects, which only a few people understood. So she was not surprised when Martha used words she didn't know. Martha laughed as she had done the first morning. There now, she said. I've talked Broad Yorkshire again, like Mrs. Medlock said I mustn't. Now to so it means nothing of the sort, slowly and carefully. But it takes so long to say it. Yorkshire's sunniest place on earth when it's sunny. I told thee that I'd like more after a bit. Just you wait till you see gold coloured gorse blossoms and blossoms at broom and heather flowering all purple bells and hundreds of butterflies fluttering, bees humming and skylarks soaring up and singing. You'll want to get out on it at sunrise and live out on it all day like Dickon does. Could I ever get there? asked Mary wistfully, looking through her window at the far off blue. It was so new and so big and wonderful and such a heavenly colour. I don't know, answered Martha. That's never used thy legs since thou were born, it seems to me. That couldn't walk five mile. It's five mile to our cottage. I should like to see your cottage. Martha stared at her a moment curiously before she took up a polishing brush and began to rub the grate again. She was thinking that the small plain face did not look quite as sour at this moment as it had done the first morning she saw it. It looked just a trifle like little Susan Ann's when she wanted something very much. 
I'll ask my mother about it, she said. She's one of them that nearly always sees a way to do things. It's my day out today and I'm going home. Hey, I'm glad. Mrs Medlock thinks a lot of mother. Perhaps she could talk to her. I like your mother, said Mary. I should think that did, agreed Martha, polishing away. I've never seen her, said Mary. No, that hasn't, replied Martha. She sat up on her heels again and rubbed the end of her nose with the back of her hand, as if puzzled for a moment, but she ended quite positively. Well, she's that sensible and hard-working and good-natured and clean that no one could help liking her, whether they'd seen her or not. When I'm going home to her on my day out, I jump for joy when I'm crossing more. I, I like Dickon, added Mary, and I've never seen him. Well, said Martha stoutly, I've told thee that very birds like him, and rabbits, and wild sheep, and ponies, and foxes themselves. I wonder, staring at her reflectively, what Dickon would think of thee. He wouldn't like me, said Mary, in her stiff, cold little way. No one does. Martha looked reflective again. How does thou like thyself? She inquired, really quite as if she were curious to know. Mary hesitated a moment and thought it over. Not at all, really, she answered but I never thought of that before. Martha grinned a little, as if at some homely recollection. Mother said that to me once, she said. She was at a wash tub and I were in a bad temper and talking ill of folk and she turns round on me and says, Thy young bixen tha. There tha stands saying tha don't like this one and tha don't like that one. How does tha like thyself? It made me laugh and it brought me to my senses in a minute. She went away in high spirits as soon as she'd given Mary her breakfast. She was going to walk five miles across the moor to the cottage and she was going to help her mother with the washing and do the week's baking and enjoy herself thoroughly. Mary felt lonelier than ever when she knew she was no longer in the house. She went out in the garden as quickly as possible and the first thing she did was to run round and round the fountain flower garden ten times. She counted the times carefully and when she was finished she felt better in spirits. The sunshine made the whole place look different. The high, deep, blue sky arched over Misselthwaite as well as over the moor and she kept lifting her face and looking up into it trying to imagine what it would be like to lie down on one of those little snow white clouds and float about. She went into the first kitchen garden and found Ben Weatherstaff working there with two other gardeners. The change in the weather seemed to have done him good. He spoke to her of his own accord. Springtime's come in, he said. Cannot thou smell it? Mary sniffed and thought she could. I smell something nice and fresh and damp, she said. That's good rich earth, he answered, digging away. It's in a good humour, making ready to grow things. It's glad when planting time comes. It's dull in winter when it's gotten out to do. In flower gardens out there, things will be stirring down below in dark. Sun's warming them. You'll see bits of green spikes sticking out at black earth after a bit. What will they be? asked Mary. Crocuses and snowdrops and daffy down dillies. Has they never seen them? No. Everything's hot and wet and green after the rains in India, said
said Mary. And I think things grow up in a night. These won't grow up in a night, said Weatherstaff. They'll have to wait for them. They'll poke up a bit higher here and push out a spike more there and uncurl a leaf this day and another that. You watch them. I'm going to, answered Mary. Very soon she heard the soft rustling flight of wings again and she knew at once that the robin had come again. He was very pert and lively and hopped about so close to her feet and put his head on one side and looked at her so shyly that she asked Ben Weatherstaff a question. Do you think he remembers me? She said. Remembers thee? Said Weatherstaff indignantly. He knows every cabbage stump in gardens, let alone people. He's never seen a little wench before and is bent on finding out all about me. There's no need to try, any, try and hide anything from him. I think stirring down below in the dark, in that garden where he lives, Mary inquired. What garden? grunted Weatherstaff, becoming surly again. The one where the old rose trees are. She could not help asking because she wanted so much to know. Are all the flowers dead? Or do some of them come again in the summer? Are there ever any roses? Ask him, said Ben Weatherstaff, hunching his shoulders towards the robin. He's the only one as knows. No one else has been inside it for ten years. Ten years was a long time, Mary thought. She'd been born ten years ago. She walked away, slowly thinking. She'd begun to like the garden, just as she'd begun to like the robin and Dickon and Martha's mother. She was beginning to like Martha too. That seemed a good many people to like, when you were not used to liking. She thought of the robin as one of the people. She went to her walk outside the long, ivy-covered wall over which she could see the treetops. And the second time she walked up and down, the most interesting and exciting thing happened to her, and it was all through Ben Weatherstaff's robin. She heard a chirp and a twitter, and when she looked at the bare flower bed at her left side, there he was, hopping about and pretending to peck things out of the earth to persuade her that he'd not followed her. But she knew he had followed her, and the surprise so filled her with delight that she almost trembled a little. You do remember me, she cried. You do. You're prettier than anything else in the world. She chirped and talked and coaxed, and he hopped and flirted his tail and twittered. It was as if he were talking. His red waistcoat was like satin and he puffed his tiny breast out and was so fine and so grand and so pretty that it was really as if he were showing her how important and like a human person a robin could be. Mistress Mary forgot that she'd ever been contrary in her life when he allowed her to draw closer and closer to him and bend down and talk and tried to make something like robin sounds. Oh, to think that he should actually let her come as near to him as that. He knew nothing in the world would make her put out her hand towards him or startle him in the least tiniest way. He knew it because he was a real person, only nicer than any other person in the world. She was oh so happy that she scarcely dared to breathe. The flower bed was not quite bare. It was bare of flowers because the perennial plants had been cut down for their winter rest. But there were tall shrubs and low ones which grew together at the back of the bed. And as the robin hopped about under them, she saw him hop over a small pile of freshly turned up earth. He stopped on it to look for a worm. The earth had been turned up because a dog had been trying to dig up a mole and he scratched quite a deep hole. 
Mary looked at it, not really knowing why the hole was there. And as she looked, she saw something almost buried in the newly turned soil. It was something like a ring of rusty iron or brass. And when the robin flew up into a tree nearby, she put out her hand and picked the ring up. It was more than a ring, however. It was an old key, which looked as if it had been buried a long time. Mistress Mary stood up and looked at it with an almost frightened face as it hung from her finger. Perhaps it's been buried for 10 years, she said. Perhaps it is the key to the garden. That's quite exciting. The end of the chapter. I can remember the first time that I read that chapter when I was probably about eight or nine and how excited I felt when Mary had scrambled around in the mud and the soil and pulled out this key. I can almost see it now. How exciting. Is it the key to the secret garden? Let's read on tomorrow and find out. Thanks.